All right, good afternoon, everyone. I have uh, 2 o'clock my time, 4 o'clock East Coast time, and welcome to the July 15th ISFSI happy hour. And uh, we're pretty excited. We have 24 folks signed in so far today and a lot of familiar faces, but uh, a few missing. One of them being Seth is not available today. So uh, I'll be starting us off, and then hopefully all of you will be taking it from there, but uh, today we're going to talk about building company standards training programs and some of the ins and outs of that and what we can do to uh, base what we do off of our company standards. And like always, if you keep your microphone muted and use the chat room to ask questions, I'll try and field uh, the questions as everybody shares a little bit. But uh, Peter Van Dorp, our director, is uh, on the line. I think I just saw you someplace. Pete, there you are. You moved on my screen. But uh, Peter, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, company standards and building company standards training programs. So, yeah, so here, here comes the challenge, right, for, for all of us, is uh, the, the, I think it, it comes down to mission creep in the fire service right we we are uh, not a year goes by not a month goes by that uh we haven't been mandated with all right now you have to meet this standard you have to meet this uh requirement you have to train you know and then people are laying this stuff on us all the time and there's only so many hours in a day and a lot of times there's only so many contractual hours in a day and i hope that a few of the folks that are on the line can speak to that uh, today and how you, you know, if that's a challenge for you, and if it is, um, how have you been working with it? Because uh, contractually, a lot of fire departments find um, that, that they're limited by their labor agreements, how many training hours <clears throat> they can have during the course of the day, or those various restrictions about weather and, and those those other things. So, so how do you work this all in, right? How, how do you, how do you keep your folks? I mean, I, I mean, if you, I, I think, that if we were brutally compliant, right, you'd find yourself um, running out of training time with just the bare bones minimum, you know, somebody's requiring you to do this, the really boring shit that, that nobody wants to do. If you were brutally compliant, that would probably eat up all of your training time. So, and I think in our nature, the, the one of the good things about the fire service, it's in our nature to say, okay, we need to work around this, right? Because we truly are teams and we truly are team builders and we truly do want to improve as companies, right? I mean, I, I think that, um, that it's been our saving grace, I think, is that um, when it comes down to it, that company does rely on each other and they, they understand that in a, very real, in a very real way, right? And they want a basic minimum competency amongst the group. Um, and so how do you make that work? Right. And first off, is it a problem? I mean, because there's there's places where you've got to stop the guys from training. Right. They they want to go all day long. And that's all fine and good. Right. But how do you make it work when that's not necessarily the case? And how do you balance these things? How do, how do you make it? Um, you know, it's a challenge we all face. Right. How, how do you make this that, that the classic, you know, hands on versus online sort of thing. Right. Um, if it wasn't for the online training, there's no way you'd get through it all. You know, I, I think at least that was at least toward the end of my career. That was the if it wasn't for that, there was no way we were getting through all this stuff. Um, but then you, you've got to be able to temper that. Right. You've got to give the guys some kind of break. It's almost like a reward system. I think, you know, if you if you get through all the bullshit, I'll let you break shit and get dirty, uh, you know, and then and maybe that's the answer. Right. Maybe maybe it is, you know, to, to build some kind of reward system where and actually we we've thought of. Um, actually doing this to some extent right uh, with the state training academy where you've got you know there's these premier programs that everybody wants there's a waiting list for um how do you earn your way into those programs right um and it's not just about earning your way in it's it, we found that the best prepared students get the most out of that premier program so it makes sense to earn your way into the program right if you, if you do it right and so perhaps that's part of the answer and perhaps I'm taking this in a direction that somebody else wants to restart into another direction. So I'm not going to belabor it, 
I just thought I'd kick it off with that sort of, what do you guys think? What, where are the challenges at and how do, you, how do you meet company standards? What are those? Who sets them? All that sort of stuff. Hey, Peter, you, you said something in that uh, very uh, eloquent opening monologue, we'll call it. Uh, you said something about some crews or some shifts, some stations, you can't stop them from training. But the question is, are they training on the stuff that we need them to train on, or are they training on the stuff that they want to train on? And yeah. is building a company standards training program more about um, maximizing their time and making sure that we get to the stuff that we need to? Because I have I have folks that if they had free reign of what they trained on, they'd be either doing live fire every day or they'd be doing rope rescue every day, right? Um, yeah. So how do we how do we get them to have the same energy towards the other things, or do we have to mandate that as training divisions or training officers uh, as far as the delegation of their time? I don't know if you're doing. I don't know if that's if it's even worth trying. And I'll, I'm just putting it out that way to generate the discussion. But seriously, I mean, the sexy stuff is the sexy stuff, right? It is fun. To, to get that harness on and go dangling off the side of the building. And that's fun. You know, if you've got a car to cut up, that can be fun, right? If, you know, if you got, and certainly if you're gonna break shit and get dirty, you got a, a training facility, you can do some live fire training. That's fun and of course that's what they wanna do. Um, but um, what I, I think one of the things I was trying to get to was you'll, you'll often find during live fire training that some of the basic skills are lacking, right? basic forcible entry skills, basic line management skills, right? So to earn your way to that training tower, you have to demonstrate competency in those basic line management skills and that kind of stuff, which can be done anywhere, right? So yeah, they're boring. And, and, um, and you know, maybe that's part of just how they're, they're being presented. But I mean, they, they can become, um, yeah, the guys aren't so enthusiastic about Right. So how do you get them enthused? Maybe it's you have to you have to earn your way into that that better training sort of deal. And I think part of it also is just really good scheduling. You know, if you're schedule if you if you if you lay into your scheduling some of this, um, yeah, I gotta give them something sexy to do every every week or so, or it's gonna get, you know, long and hard. Um, to the extent you're you're able to do that and you think about it, right? Lay in some of the stuff that they have fun with. Uh, that might help it as well. Because sometimes I think it's just seasonal. There's times a year when it's, this is the boring training crap, right? And there's times a year where it's the exciting stuff. Um, and as training officers, we, you know, you can't completely fix that, but you do have a little bit of wiggle room, I would think, where you could, if you look at your schedule from an entertainment standpoint, as well as from another, all those other things, you might have those opportunities to spread that stuff out a little bit. I don't know if that answered your question or if I just got on another rant. No, you're doing great, and I want to point out that if you didn't see it, Chris Jett did the coolest thing. When you started talking, Peter, Chris's whole um, image did a whole 360. It was it was pretty cool. So, Chris, you brought us entertainment there, which was pretty awesome. Um, look at EMS training. Our state, and I'm sure it's very similar in other states, has it broken down. You have to do X number of hours of CPR refresh or X number of hours of pediatric, X number of hours of of different training are any of you doing that with um, jprs or fire ground operation stuff where annually you have to do so many hours of fire dynamics or so many hours of forcible entry or so many hours of hose management anybody do anything similar to what we do in ems hey jason go ahead so uh I don't know that we really put a hour total on it, but uh, we try to run uh, quarterly or at least uh, semi-annual uh, multi-unit or multi-company drills. And the months leading up to that uh, are the, as uh, uh, Chief Van Dorp said, the bullshit um, that leads up to the fun shit um, uh, to, Make sure that when they get there to the multi-company drill, they don't they don't look like a bunch of clowns. So the incentive for them to do the not so fun stuff um, is if we don't do it, then when we get to the multi-company drill, we might look like a bunch of clowns in front of everybody. 
Um, so that kind of gives them some incentive of uh, doing that. Uh, we've also tried, um, you know, we do we do all of our uh, EMS uh, requirements on a quarterly basis as well, and uh, we've we started trying to incorporate fire scenarios with that. Um, just to try to make them not as boring. Uh, uh, also, like um, last quarter's topic was a uh, burn management. So we incorporated a simulated live fire scenario uh, with the May Day, and uh, the crews had to go in, get a victim out, and then a crew had to take over uh, EMS patient care management by using all of the uh, burn stuff that we had to prep for either using target solutions or some other, uh, you know, daily training topic. Uh, and that that went over extremely well. Um, so uh, I hope that uh, we uh, we continue that in the future. But uh, um, anything you can do to incentivize them to do the uh, boring stuff so that they don't um, look bad in front of their peers, um, you know, peer pressure is a powerful thing. Uh, and you are right. Uh, you know, there are some people that would hang off of a rope every day or cut a car every day. Um, and of course, there's some people that would go out and practice putting band-aids on every day. God bless them. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, that's that's what that's what we've done, and it uh, it seems to work. Uh, we we just got back into Target Solutions, um, so uh, uh, you know, I'm waiting to see how that's going to. Uh, play into our new routine. Chris, do you uh, just maybe a little help on your organization? Do you do uh, a monthly or quarterly calendar with checkoffs that the crews have to get through or individuals have to get through either via target solutions or hands-on type of JPRs? So uh, the target solutions is um, ad hoc. So whenever they put something on there, you know, we have X number of days to get it done. Um, uh, we're trying to get, we're, we, like I said, we just, just kicked back off, uh, being back into target solutions probably about two or three months ago. So we're building that routine back up. Uh, at uh, one point in time, we were doing all of uh, the NFPA, uh, uh, standard evolutions and we had those broken down by a month. Uh, and, uh, each month, every company was required to, uh, do one of those standardized evolutions, uh, document it and then uh, put it into our uh, uh, records management system. Uh, we've kind of gotten away from that, uh, but uh, it looks like the shift is to maybe start trying to get get back into that so that we have uh, something um, something tangible to tie, uh, you know, tie the training to as to why we're doing it and not just doing it to do it. Great. And then one more question for you, Chris. Two questions, actually. How big an organization are you with, Chris? Um, we have a combination department of around 150 or so uh, career and, uh, you know, depending on who you ask, between 100 to 200 volunteers. Okay. And do you offer different company standards training, whether they're part-time or volunteer versus the career staff, or are they all acquired to meet the same standard and the same training requirements? Um, everything is supposed to be done uh, the same across the board. Um, all of our all of our career staff are full time. We don't have any part time, and then you know all the volunteer are just that. Um, uh, they are they are supposed to meet all the same uh, you know, uniform rank structure and uh, you know training requirements and everything. Um, uh, you know. There might not be as many opportunities for them based on the availability of like uh, uh, acquired structures and the uh, amount of time we have them and things like that. Uh, but uh, we we do our best to uh, um, keep keep things as uh, you know the same across the board as we possibly can. Okay. Good. Anybody else doing anything as far as company standards and how they track them? Uh, do they do quarterly or monthly versions of that, etc.? So we do quarterly, but we don't do one size fits all. So what we do is we pick a topic. Let's say it's forcible entry. 
And we have, you know, I go back to Peter's comment earlier when he opened up the, the meeting with about mission creed, right? So understanding what your mission is. My engine companies do engine work, right? My truck company should be doing truck work. Uh, and my rescue, my heavy rescue should be doing heavy rescue work. However, let's say we got the, the forcible entry um, example. I don't expect my engine companies to be able to perform forcible entry at the level of the technical expertise is my truck companies. So when I push out that forcible entry training, I have basically three levels. I have meets, for, you know, distilled vernacular, uh, the mission creed of that company um, exceeds or does not meet. So if they don't meet uh, certain standards, then, then they have to work toward those. And so a truck company is going to, their standard is gonna be higher on that forcible ent uh, entry or forcible uh, entry than, than the engine companies. Um, and then everybody wants to be that hero, right? So you're talking about in incentivizing. So nobody wants to be performing at the lowest level. So they're going to continue to strive and, and meet those. You know, it becomes almost a competition when we bring them down to the training center. But we make it very clear, if you're only meeting this standard, you're either not meeting the organizational standard or you're going to get remedial training. Um, and that's published. I mean, we, we put it out there internally. Brandon, where are you from? Uh, South Bend, Indiana. Okay, great. And how big of organization? 21 companies, uh, about 270 staff. Okay. Can you expand a little bit more on the meets versus exceed? Um, so obviously you have a minimum standard. So a, a, a person assigned to the truck company is going to have just the basic hose management or nozzle technique or, or that function versus... Um, maybe a little bit better on forcible entry or uh, another sure. truck skill, correct? Right. Yeah. So like the, the truck companies, um, honestly, I'm trying to push them away from doing much hose work at all uh, okay. in, in the perfect world. I mean, I'm that guy who doesn't want to see pumps on, on trucks, um, but we have the staffing and the equipment to be able to do that. Uh, and so it works for us. Uh, the problem then comes into credentialing when people cross for overtime and here we are in this COVID situation and a prime example sometimes this can bite you in the rear um, I picked up overtime as a battalion chief um, on two days ago and we had a duplex uh, three-story duplex that got up in the attic space and I had an engine guy who hasn't who was assigned to the truck and um, it took 12 minutes to get the aerial to the roof and by that point the the, the advantage of doing the top side cut was um, negated. So I went back and I started pulling all of his training records. The guy hasn't done truck work in four years any, to even document training. So then I yell at the battalion chief that did the staffing that day. Why, why did you even have him on a truck? You know, and so those are some internal problems we, we're having to deal with. Um, but, but it, it all goes back to that mission creed, you know, what are you doing the same things that you say you can do? Um, and, and, I'm using that to my, my leverage right now to, to force companies to, to come up to standards. Thanks, Brandon. I, actually, you nailed a follow-up question I had, which was, do you have backfill or uh, overtime shifts that folks do with trades that they would trade from a truck company or a rescue company to an engine company and then maybe be missing some of those skills or not as proficient at those skills because they haven't practiced them in a while? Yeah, so right now that's that's exactly the case. And we go up for contract negotiation in 2021 and then probably again in 2023. By 2023, I want it to be a credentialed spot. And that's going to, you know, then that gets put on the training division's shoulders to, to make that doable for the organization. Thanks a lot for sharing, Brandon. I, and I would imagine that if anybody wants to uh, talk to Brandon about what they're doing and that uh, he'd share that with us. Anybody else doing anything unique with company standards training in their organization? I'll uh, share a little bit. We're a combination department, small, small combination department. So we, we pale in comparison to most of you. So every time we do these happy hours, I walk out of here with about 60 items that I want to talk to somebody about, but we do a, a quarterly, monthly standards book for our members. We have a small career force and then resident college students and about 80 volunteers. And we broke it up by quarter. And uh, 
in the booklet is uh, tasks that they have to do and we combine that with a video so we give them a vision of what that task is so they can practice it perfectly and then we also provide a document that they have to either uh, record their times on or sign off that they completed it along with that we'll follow it up uh, for like our pump operators we have um, specific position minimum quarterly standards uh, for the pump operators we'll do a Google uh, document or a quiz where they'll have to answer the questions, simple 10 to 15 questions uh, that quarter to complete their training. And our members have to complete that training to receive uh, their incentives, whether it's their college tuition reimbursement or their um, cash incentive that they get for being a part of our organization. We also do it with our command officers. They have to do uh, about four or five hours of command training. So whether it's residential structure fire, multi-company structure fire, uh, a hazmat event, or a big box store, and we just utilize uh, scenario-based training for that where they have to get online and we share that uh, with our training division and they have to actually run an incident through a simulator and um, we record it and grade it just to keep them proficient on their skills because some of our on-shift command officers might not hit a working structure fire for six weeks and uh, that way they keep their proficiency up so that's a little bit of what we're doing here on a small scale and that might be harder to scale up to a large department but for us it, it really works out pretty well so I think there's a question Chief Schaefer can you talk a bit about your fire dynamics training pop cadre and that's from yeah, Peter so, Van Dorp. yeah before I, yeah, talk, sure. I want to, to set the table for him good so give you a little bit of time to think about it Chief um, so I wanted to j just to maybe shift the discussion a little bit toward champions um, in terms of how, how do you, you know, how do you stimulate this training for the less sexy stuff or how do you get guys interested? And, and it, it's going to vary a lot, again, by size of department. So my, my example is going to be in a very small department. And I was hoping that maybe Chief Schaefer could, Schaefer could chime in with what he's doing with uh, the, the larger department and how he's approaching it. So, my example is, um, you know, CPR is something that none of us, especially after the first decade or so, are all that thrilled about having to, to uh, recertify on, right? And it can eat up some time. Uh, but if you get the right guy, right, if you get an, an internal guy to do it and you get the right guy that knows, uh, that is passionate about this, right, maybe teaches it on his side job or whatever, um, and then can engage the, the members in doing this, where they're not just going through the motions, they actually like, and in, in my case, you know, this guy's name was Sean, and um, this was like his side gig, right? He was just really passionate about training civilians in CPR and all that. And the offshoot of all this was, is that he always made it interesting, he always made it fun, and he always did it in a, in a way that respected the fact that, that the membership and the fire department um, were experts at this. They had actually performed CPR in real live dead people many, many times, uh, so he kept them engaged that way, right? And he always brought them through it. And, and it actually came to where guys look forward to, the, to that sort of thing. So I think part of the, um, I'll come back to other pieces of, but I think that's a piece of the puzzle on how to keep, you know, company standards up on some of those things that are easy to let slip, uh, is that you have to, you have to either be the champion or find a champion. And does that make sense to you, Steve? Can you speak to a little bit about the group you put together with the, that demonstrate that, you know, the alcohol product. Yeah, okay. sure. Let me, let me uh, just back up a bit and just put my two cents in. So in a fairly large department like ours, when I was in charge of training, I'm now out in the field, but um, just recently, but, you know, as much as we trained and we trained almost every day, uh, we had companies down doing uh, the fire dynamics, our back to basics live fire program. We had, um, some uh, truck company skills, you know, whatever the programs were, there were always companies coming down. You still only hit each individual a few times a year if you were lucky. They might have been on vacation, they swapped it off, uh, they were sick that day. Sure. And and so, Steve, I don't mean to interrupt, for, for the guys that can't guess by your accent, uh, the department. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I work for Boston, right? So um, well, I, I hate to be, you know, it sounds like we're Luddites, but you know, we don't have, you know, qualifications. Once you get on the job and you get out of drill school, that's it. You would, you have to like, you know, do something really horrific to be, to be fired, let go, disciplined. Um, but my philosophy is you've got to get the company officers involved. 
They're the ones that, that have their crews, that know their crews, that see them day in, day out. Those guys have to be training. And I think that speaks to um, the need for officer development in general. And uh, I've talked to a lot of guys, Mark Davidson among them, uh, that the fire service is really not doing a very well, a very good job at, uh, at once we promote our officers in, in setting out the expectations. And part of that is that they are trainers. The officer as a trainer and the trainer as a leader and, and vice versa. Um, so one of the things that, that I think what Pete was getting at, what we, what I did when I was there is I try to, to seek out talent within the department. Guys who are really motivated, who aren't in training, but are out in the field, but have an extra base of knowledge and a desire to teach and bring them into the fold to see what they have to offer. I think it's always, um, it's always better for the, for the, the troops coming in, if someone instructing them hasn't been down at the academy for eight or 10 years, the, the, the attitude on the field is, oh, they've been fighting the same build, you know, concrete uh, building and fire for the last eight years. What do they know? They're not out in the street. Whereas if they see someone who they work with, especially someone who's respected, that was with them on the two alarm fire a week ago, that carries a lot more weight in terms of uh, the instruction. Uh, and specifically, I think uh, Pete was asking about, we, um, We've got uh, a, a brand new prop. Uh, we took delivery last May, and it's a, uh, a three-story Connex box fire building that's specifically set up to replicate wind-driven and flow path conditions. You know, we, we uh, uncoordinated ventilation will, will cause the fire to move, um, and we got uh, we got a, a cadre of about between the regular academy staff and then adjuncts from the field. We call them got about 25 instructors and some of them are are really keyed in. Uh, Mike McCarthy is uh, the lead, Captain McCarthy. He came down to the UL boot camp uh, in Philly to show them how to use a tabletop prop we had. And uh, really just, um, you know, getting the guys who who are motivated already to, to teach and, and bring that enthusiasm and street credibility, uh, I think goes a long way towards, um, towards, uh, building up the uh, the enthusiasm, the, the uh, buy-in level from the troops. Uh, and I'd also just say about uh, about the, you know, sort of the credentialing and the check boxes. I, I understand for record keeping and, you know, it's it's a way to, to say, yes, everybody has been trained uh, and to sort of CYA, but um, I think the best training, firefighters really learn the best by doing. And the best training is when when we bring them down and they get off the piece and instead of, you know, having a, oh, hey, how you doing? I haven't seen you in a while. Get your gear on. This is the mission, you know, the, the lesson plan. This is what we're doing. Now let's go. Like you, you just, you know, let's get moving. That's been, uh, as, as I see it, the most successful uh, training we've done. You know, when you sit them down in the classroom and give them, okay, here's the lesson plan and this is what we're going to do later, but you got to, you know, by the time you get to actually, you know, getting dirty and breaking shit, as Pete said, you've kind of lost half of the battle. That they're just looking to get back to the barn and have lunch. So um, I don't know if I answered your question, Pete. I just, uh, you know, I tra right. training's tough. We're all looking for, you know, we all know the uh, the textbook answer, right? And but we're looking at ways to how do you manifest it? How do you? And and there's a for every guy on this, you know, chat room here today. There's another approach, another way to look at it, another idea. Um, and I was just, you know, just wanted to hit as many as we could. I know you've had some really good success down there with the whole introducing the fire dynamics to, to the Boston firefighters and all that. And as you said, they're only going to listen to a guy they respect. And, yeah. and so sometimes that respect isn't, isn't a general respect. Sometimes it's a specific respect, right? Sure. So, you know, so the guy, you know, if the guy is known to be the expert on your job in this particular topic, he should be the guy leading the charge, you know, or developing the program or in some way getting credit, right? You put that expert's name on whatever it is you're trying to accomplish that helps sell the, the package. And I, yeah, think that's I, I think I think that's that's true. And I, but there's, you know, that's that was a specific program that we rolled out department wide. I think a, a lot of times, uh, you know, it seemed like we were talking about company level training, just like the basics. You, you mentioned forcible entry. My position is I want guys to be, especially on the trucks, to be so familiar with a Halligan and a mall or a Halligan and a, and a, and a Flathead X that at three o'clock in the morning, half asleep, they're not thinking about which end to put in, where on the door they're going to force. They just do it. They should be thinking about what's on the other side of that door. Where am I going when I get through? You know, like 
if you have to worry about the basics or if you're, you know, if you're not confident with the basics, the whole operation is going to suffer. And so the only way to do that is through continuous repetition at the company level. And that's something that the officers are responsible for. And I think it's, you know, we in Boston have done a not so good job of making it, you know, a clear expectation to the officers that that's really incumbent upon them for that basic company level training. Sure. So, so let's help a brother out. How do, how do we get, how do we motivate these, these Boston company officers? Anybody got any suggestions? You know, what, what works? You, I mean, you've all been a company officer at one point. What, what works? What made you want to train your company? Anybody? Don't make me talk all, all day. You know Peter, maybe, we should, maybe we should ask Jesse about mentoring and how they mentor and still enthusiasm uh, in their company <laughs> officers so they do have buy-in and training. So Jess, do you want to oh, can't touch on mentoring and how that works? Mary was leaning forward like she was going to say something. So I'm going okay. to call on Mary first. You got something for us, well, Mary? Um, my thoughts weren't specifically answering your question but i teach one of those topics that people do not want to take and it's i teach all writing related topics sometimes it's basic writing skills sometimes it's report writing but basically people are coming into that classroom like why are they making me be here today and so i teach all over the country so i've seen um some of the techniques that really do help with buy-in. So for a topic like that, um, and I guess this would this would relate as an answer, one is establishing a need, having a recognized need and, and, and having some consequences when people haven't met the standard, whatever it is, those two things can um, create some interest and buy-in. But for a topic like mine with writing, um, some of the things that make it work are Number one, if the people in the department who everybody sees how they write, and this is certainly most true for people at chief level, if those folks are not in the class, and throughout the class I'm hearing people say, well, you know who really needs who ought to be in this class, because you know our chief is sending us emails full of mistakes and errors on a regular basis. On the other hand, I have worked for departments where from the day they decide to offer writing classes, um, maybe there's been a chief who's attended a session of mine at FRI or that I've uh, taught in their as a regional program or something like that. And so they'll start um, speaking supportively about the class and about the relevance and that it's not going to be boring, even though they, they're afraid it's going to be a seventh grade uh, English class. You know, that's what they anticipate coming into. But when there's buy-in from the chief or the training officer, uh, when that person that has brought me in, the training officers, the chief attends the class or attends it for the majority of time, instantly there's more buy-in. If the um, training division uh, makes it easy enough for people to get trades or to have coverage so that people aren't moving in and out, sometimes it's essential. They have to, they, they just don't have the staffing to provide coverage, but many times they'll have somebody come in second due or third due and you know shift it around. So they're showing respect for the topic. So those are the things that on a topic um, like mine really have helped. And the other is, um, and in the incent in the incentive end is providing some sort of certification or applying it to um, some standard that your folks are trying to meet. Um, a lot of departments have been able to get credit for company officer training or training officer training, working through a community college um, because I am certified to teach at that level. So um, those are the things that I've seen help, but it really comes for respect for the topic itself from the people who are asking everybody else to attend. And Mary, I think that's that's spot on. Is uh, That's a, another example I like to say, of, you know, leading by example. If the, the chief officers attend the training, even if they don't, uh, I, I attend almost all the training that, uh, that the guys in my station go through. Um, you know, 
I don't if, if it's a ropes course, I don't necessarily go over the side and hook up, but it, at least to uh, to be there to observe, uh, I think that uh, goes a long way towards um, at least making people feel that it's legitimate training as opposed to just uh, just something they have to, to go through or, or why are we here. It's, you know, it shows your support for uh, what's going on. Yeah, I think Robert has something to add there, Robert. Yeah. Um, I was just going to echo what he said, and he brought it up. You know, the, the most successful training programs are, are ones that everybody has buy-in, and, uh, you know, from the top to the bottom, and, and especially, you know, when the chief officers and stuff show up, that really makes a difference um, because it only takes one or two loud voices to start crumbling that castle, if you will, you know, and if those are our, our chief officer voices or something like that, that really makes a difference. Um, whereas, you know, you can have the people at the bottom crumble a, a training too, but if you can get some buy-in from everyone and, and show, you know, and, and have the people that have the louder voices stamp out some of the, the people that are not as enthused or, or get them involved, you know, uh, whether it's another firefighter or a mentor or whatever, that really makes it successful. Um, but that's what, that's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Mary, go ahead, Mary. Well, on that same idea, one of the things that I do with my topic, because I know there's going to be resistance to my even being there. Um, and for those of you that don't know me, I'm a retired firefighter from South Metro Denver. So I was on the other side of all this. So I know the folks that I'm working with. But um, uh, what was I going to say? I lost my thought, Robert, about um, your point there. Oh, so one of the things I do very early in the class is I give people, I ask a question, um, something like, um, have, have you seen your department or individuals in your department suffer consequences from poorly written documents? And no matter where I am in the country, people always have examples that support that, that they can answer. Like, why does this, you know, why does this matter is really what I'm trying to get them, get them to answer instead of me. Because I'm a stranger, they don't know me, most of them. So I have them in small groups answer that question, what have you seen? And instantly, early in the day, those folks have now vocalized the need. Here's the need, here's the consequences, here's what happened to this person that I really like not to have happen to me. Uh, in the world of writing, and so it is so now those one or two loud voices have already heard the majority of people chime in without saying yes, we want this class. That's not what they're saying. They're simply pointing out we recognize the need. So I think if you can build that, have it come from the line on whatever your topic is, it can help set the stage, whether it be the day of the training or preceding the training. Yeah, we, we often talk about how important it is to listen, but we don't act it out. And I think you make a really good point about that. That's listening in a, in a very uh, big way. Yeah, Jesse. And then Aaron, I won't forget you either. Jess, what do you got? So uh, from the mentoring angle, the ISFSI, we have the mentoring coaching committee uh, to launch that new initiative. So there is a survey that just came out through the Academy newsletter to uh, gauge interest in people serving as a mentor. So as a quick uh, shameless plug for that program, please feel free to uh, log in and complete that survey. It's super important. Um, one of the things that we do here at our department is um, we focus on habit formation. So when all else fails, sudden bad event, um, whatever, whatever could go wrong, does go wrong, we want people to have strong habits because um, we do believe that you fall back on your habits versus just falling back simply on your training. And I think Chief Schaefer hit the nail on the head when he talked about competence. And uh, there's four phases of, comp of competence. There is unconscious incompetence, where if you think about somebody on the first day of recruit school or their academy, they don't know what they don't know. Um, that's a simple way of putting it. To where what Chief Schaefer is referring to is at three o'clock in the morning and they're trying to open a door, we don't necessarily need them to think or want them to think through the detailed list. We just want it to happen. So that is, that is unconscious competence. It, you're so well um, versed in what you're doing that it's it's basically automatic at that point because you've built those habits and those habits are built through a series of uh, cues, routines, and rewards. And uh, so way, the way that we build the habits is we, we like to say that dynamic training equals dynamic results. 
and dynamic training by nature um, builds excitement and it appeals to the senses. So by appealing to the senses, it's not just what does this sound like in terms of a lecture, but when we can expand that, what does it look like? What does it feel like? Um, you know, those sorts of things. And we want to really engage people. And, and through that dynamic training process, we, we hope to promote uh, critical thinking. So the number one way that, that we make training uh, beneficial, and this also has a mentoring piece to it from the, the role of the company officers or a coaching um, piece to it, I suppose, is we, we do focus back on those basic skills when we can. And then we dial up the intensity and we do that through stress inoculation, which is really a three-step process um, where you're teaching somebody to conceptualize a skill. And then the next part of this is the skill building, which comes back to that a lot of times that company officer or even the role of the shift commander to make sure that those basic skills are being built. And then we have them from a training standpoint, we can do the practice and application piece. So if you think of an SCBA, SCBA confidence course, that would be a great example of stress inoculation where people are getting a lot from it because they're leaving with this very um you know and our probationary exam is a great example and i always say it's, it's very difficult but it it the gift to the probationary firefighter at that point on day 365 is they really know what rock bottom feels like for lack of better terms and the goal is to never get back to that point because it is such a mentally and physically exhausting uh, testing process so stress inoculation is one way that we do these things. Uh, we, we It's gradual, it's incremental, it's to a ceiling. Uh, if you think of uh, the movie Dodgeball, where he th says, if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. That that would be an extreme example of uh, stress inoculation. Um, and maybe, a, again, an example where it wasn't graduated into a ceiling. But um, we have gotten a lot of value out of stress inoculation. Last concept, last thing I'll... I'll equate it to, and this was a decision-making standpoint from incident commanders. Um, we did a, an emergency egress drill, and we had a, a, a vacant property that happened to be a, a psychiatric hospital, and really lent itself well to a lot of of different trainings. But uh, the skill that we really reinforced there was forcible egress, um, more so than even forcible entry. So we essentially had crews enter as they were staffed that day, and uh, so them and their partner would come in with whatever tools they would bring. We'd get them to a certain point where they had a, a basically a cinder block wall, and we had a nice little tool cage that that laid down very safely and created a nice lean-to collapse. But it was amazing from the aspect of a team building skill. Uh, two guys, limited equipment, um, limited communication, and you, you really couldn't reposition. But it, it was really um, really well received, and the reason why is it, it, they were able to engage in that critical thinking process. And then the the beauty of it was. They talked about it for a long time, so we got a lot more mileage out of that training than our standard uh, PowerPoint. Really nice, Jess. Thanks. Hey, Aaron, do you want to talk about your comment in the chat room? Yeah, just first, let me tell you guys I appreciate the the uh, chat hours here. I get a lot from it. Uh, we have uh, in um, Midwestern or the Midwest here in Iowa. Uh, combination department. Um, we don't have a, a real strong fire service training bureau as far as that goes. Had, I don't know if you guys are familiar. We've had some uh, issues there that we're overcoming, and they're, the state's doing the best they can to rebuild that. And so, um, and one of the issues that we have is we run 80% of our, our calls are EMS and not very much fire, and that uh, creates uh, an issue for us or a, a training gap for us because. Um, we feel like we need the EMS training because of the, uh, the volume of calls that we run and we feel that, uh, you know, and then, we, then we kind of neglect the fire and because we don't have very many fire calls that uh, we respond to, uh, that makes it difficult. And so one of the things that I've done is to work through uh, the JPRs over like a two-year period um, to make sure that we're being thorough and covering those. And if you guys have any input, uh, again, I'm kind of new to the training officer position. This is my second year in the position, and we're just trying to rework it to make it fit. But uh, identifying gaps through the hot washes, and uh, because uh, we do a lot of awareness responses as far as tech rescue and a very limited uh, hazmat uh, response. And so um, trying to reach out, just cover, you know, the gaps that are that create probably the biggest hazard to us um, and then with, with those trainings, I, I tried my best to create, um, you know, the, the, the sexy training or the, or the ones that are fun and then to build the skills in there. So to make sure in those objectives that we're hitting, 
uh, you know, the use of the married pair and how to force a door, force entry, um, I guess is, is the best way that I've approached that. And there's some, some of the points there, report writing, things like that, just building them into scenarios um, and then having them write a report for the scenario type of deal. I guess that's the best way that I've found to make it, uh, you know, take some of the monotonous and, and things that are, are, are basic to the more experienced guys. Uh, with that, then, it, you know, again, there's two of us on the administrative staff, or then there's uh, 50 or 12 full-timers, and then we've got 32 part-timers. That's the extent of our uh, station and one station, so very small department. But uh, that's what I, I seem to have working for, for me, and it's, um, I think, you know, a work in progress from here. But I guess that's where my comment kind of came from there, Jason. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. I think you and Caleb uh, should touch base. Caleb's in uh, northern Colorado and about the same size organization, and uh, Caleb's new to the training division too, so it might be a good opportunity for you guys to share some ideas and thoughts, uh, which is all part of what the happy hour is, right? It's to build those relationships and take the opportunity to get to know and hear from some other folks from around the area. So. Um, Peter, we're about uh, 12 minutes to three. I know I got to wake you up again. Uh, <laughs> you wanna you wanna touch on anything in closing on uh, no, this no, issue? What I, what I thought I'd do before I forget, because this is just part of my job, a uh, little bit of a plug uh, for the society, just for you guys to know and, and to spread around. Um, you know, we got we're we're back up and running. We're delivering classes again. Uh, the fixed facility classes are up. And, and operating, we have seven classes open for registration. Um, and so, you know, get, get the word out that we're open for business again. Um, and in addition to that, we're also working on transitioning some of our stuff to more online deliverable stuff, you know, do, do things through webinars. We've had some interest for like the, the principles of modern fire attack, the basement fire stuff. It's, it's not ready for prime time yet, but, but keep your eyes and ears open. Um, because we're working on making these classes available online because we're getting demand to deliver classes um, and given the state of everything you know we can't necessarily go out and do them uh, in person but people are willing everybody's more willing now to do the online version of things so that stuff's coming up um, and then I guess the only other thing I just recap what I heard so far uh, fr from the group here is uh, I think that that scheduling is important. If you if you look at your schedule uh, with an eye toward, um, am I really supporting that company officer? Am I really doing what I need to do so that officer can get his work done with the company? Sometimes it's the schedule that gets in the way, and we don't really realize it. So you need to take a look at the schedule with a a different eye. Uh, how much discretion are you giving your officers? A lot of you guys, I don't know if anybody spoke to it directly, but I was hearing it kind of between the lines with. Um, you know, here's what you've got to accomplish this month. That's up to you to get it accomplished. And sometimes when you give them that kind of discretion, you'd be amazed with how much they can get done. So empower your company officers, right? If they're responsible for the training, um, working toward Matt, that different levels of stuff, understanding the difference between core competency and mastery and making sure that that's a piece of what's in the program. Cause that sometimes that's part of the motivation. People don't want to just meet minimum standards anymore. Give them something to excel at. Give them a challenge, you know, up the ante a little bit, and that might reinvigorate the whole, you know, it's basically still the basic competency is still there, but you're giving them a new target. You're giving them something else to, to shoot for. Um, uh, give credit, right? I mean, in, in some way, shape, or form, Mary alluded to this. Maybe, you know, whenever you can give college credit, wherever you can, any kind of credit that you can give, um, be creative because sometimes that has more meaning. We assume that nobody gives a shit about the piece of paper, not necessarily so. Don't make that assumption. Um, that can be a motivator for a lot of people, so take advantage of that. Uh, establishing needs, Mary hit that on the head too, right? There's a reason why we have these programs and these minimum trainings and all that. Don't if if it's because we have to, because the government said so, nobody's going to be motivated. I had a training officer. He was a genius at this. He could tie anything, anything at all to a NIOSH report. I mean, and he did a good job of it, right? He'd pick up that NIOSH report and say, here it is. This is why you need to notice. Somebody died. Somebody had a close call. Uh, he was just a genius at that. And that was a piece of, of everything he did. Um, so there's, there's always a, a reason out there. There's a need out there. And get creative. Get good at that. Um, blend the sexy and the not sexy, right? M mix things up a little bit. And um, 
And just my last little comment, because I heard somebody refer to it, right? The, you know, we, we train a lot on the stuff we do all the time. It's the stuff you don't do all the time that you really need to train on. Um, and a lot of us miss that. And if we're missing it ourselves, then the guys are going to miss that too. You know, what? Well, I, you know, we used to, you guys won't even know what this is. We have a thing called the shepherd hook on the Chicago Fire Department. And it's for getting hose up a fire escape, right? It's just a piece of metal with a chain on it. And guys say, you know, I've had this thing on the rig for 30 years. I've never used it. Why do we have to do this drill? Because you've been here for 30 years and you've never used it. That's why, you know, and if you need to use it, it's the only tool you have that will solve your problem. Um, so that's the reason why. Um, so anyway, that that's what I heard. I don't know, Jason, did you hear anything else? Yeah, I, I, Peter, I think you nailed it. And I think uh, to build on your last comment, if we look at Gordon Graham's, you know, high risk, low probability or low volume, that nails it, right? And so we spend a lot of time doing EMS stuff, which we practice a lot in the field. So we get pretty good at it, but then we also have to train on it because of state and national requirements, but we lose sight of the things that are really going to get us. And that's the fire dynamics, the fire behavior, the hose stretches, the that unique uh, opportunity where we don't practice something, but all of a sudden it bites us in the butt. Um, so, Peter, I think you eloquently added that. And then, First thing, hazmat stuff, boys and girls. If you're not doing that, not not the not the big involved shit, but the first in stuff. Man, the number of times that fire departments guys get hurt, people get hurt, things get out of because the first in company doesn't have a clue really what not to do. Right? Uh, yeah. It's one of the prime examples. Sorry about that. Got in my no, you got it. And then Mary and Jesse and. Aaron and Chief Schaefer, all thank you so much for participating. Mary, I got one more thing that I took away from yours, and that's get the cool kids in the class, whether that's the chief officer or just somebody that's got street credibility from the ranks. If they're in the class and, and promote your class, um, you're going to get the rest to follow a little bit easier. Uh, so help identify prior to class. Um, who to have in the class to make the class valid. And, and Peter does that with us through this little chat room. We talk about, hey, who should we have as a plant in the class to, to call upon if we need to? So um, Peter's our cool kid for, for a lot of us. Well, come on, guys. I mean, that's, that's why you have training, on, right? That's our job, right, is to think of that kind of shit that, that the company officer shouldn't have to think of, kind of, so to speak, right? I mean, is to, you know, it is to come up with those contrived ways to get the message across. That's why you get the extra pay bump or the extra credit or whatever it is. I don't know. Um, but yeah, you've got to have, you know, and, and you, you were spot on, Jason. If you got that chief, anytime I'm in a class where the chief of department or the division chief is in the room, it's a whole different dynamic, you know. Uh, everybody's on their toes, everybody's paying attention, and it sends the right message. This is important. If it's worth my time as a chief officer to be here, um, it's worth your time as well. It's a, it's a beautiful, it's a perfect thing. Absolutely. Outstanding. Well, anybody else have anything to add before we close her down for the day? I see the same faces and, and that's awesome that you're all returning. Uh, the one thing we ask is bring somebody with, uh, with you next time, send the yeah. invite to a, a neighboring department or a department that you're close with and uh, let's see if we can get new faces and more people on and then like always we're scrambling and searching for topics and ideas um, to host in this and and isfsi has two different online trainings right now uh, one is more of a classroom setting which is a, a podcast versus the hangout happy hour which is uh, our opportunity to share and build relationships so uh, please send us any uh, ideas, concepts that you'd like to see, because this is about you. I put my uh, email at the top. Uh, if not, Peter or Lee would be great to share those with, and uh, we'll book them. They're the first Wednesday and the third Wednesday of every month at 4 o'clock Eastern time. And uh, we're just honored to be able to have you all in the, in the room, and thanks for everybody for participating today. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good to see you all. Yeah, Keep nice. Going.